So when we're thinking about attachment, which is another word for that relationship that develops between a baby and its main person who looks after it, when we're thinking about how that happens, we need to go right back to the beginning and we need to think about how babies have a very simple set of needs. Things like, am I hungry? Um, do I want somebody to play with? Am I cold or tired? And they communicate these needs in a very obvious way. They cry. And that's a cry that um, gets everybody's attention around them. And when they cry, if they've been lucky enough to be born to carers who can look after them well enough, then that carer will notice and will come and attend to the baby and will do what's needed in order to meet those needs and soothe the baby. And before too long, the baby will have another need and will go around that cycle again with their caregiver repeatedly. And if you ask um, the parent of a newborn, they will tell you that they go around that cycle uncountable, innumerable times in a 24 hour period. And what's really amazing about this is that it's laying down into the baby's little brain, neural pathways, teaching the baby what to expect from people, from the world, when things happen to it. Um, and this is really the fundamental foundations of attachment and the foundations of what Bowlby, John Bowlby, who was one of the psychologists who talked about attachment at the very beginning, what he described as an internal working model. So the baby is learning stuff about itself and it's learning stuff about other people and it's learning stuff about the world around it. And if we think about what this baby is learning, it's learning that other people will come when it cries. It's learning that other people can understand what's, what's going on for the baby, what, what it needs and how to meet those needs. The baby's learning that other people are kind and reliable, that they show up most of the time to help out. Not all the time because we're all human and there are times when actually something gets in the way of us arriving straight away to help. And from this, the baby learns that the world is a pretty predictable and safe place in which it lives. And the baby learns stuff about itself, about his self or herself, like I am lovable, I am wanted, I am able to get people to do things for me. And baby will use this as it goes forward in life as a blueprint for the way that it interacts with people and the way it responds to people. So what I'm describing there really with this mythical baby um, who I haven't given a gender to, um, but I'm gonna call her she from now on rather than it, because it sounds nicer. What I'm describing there is how she has developed um, a secure attachment to her caregivers. And that's what happens if a baby is born into a family that is able to care for it well enough. Now, some babies are born into families where for some reason or other, maybe the parents have um, a lot of difficulties in their own lives. They're facing a lot of adversity. Um, maybe they've got drugs or alcohol problems or mental health problems. Um, maybe they haven't had a very loving and giving um, experience growing up themselves, so they haven't developed those skills as parents. Um, the baby who's born into this environment, she's going to have the same needs as the baby I described just now, and, and she may well cry um, in order to show that she's got a need. She may give up crying, but we can, we can think a bit more about that in a minute. But when she cries and her carers respond, they may well, well, they may not hear the response for a start or they may um, not know what the cry means and what the need is that needs to be responded to. 
or they may respond in an inappropriate way. For example, they may um, respond to the wrong need. So maybe she needs her nappy changing, but instead in order to stop her crying, they just pop a lolly in her mouth and, and that will keep her quiet, at least for a while. Um, it may be that they respond in another way that's inappropriate, for example, being cross or upset or angry or frightened by her own feelings. So this could mean that she gets shouted at or hit or ignored. When um, she cries and she gets one of these inappropriate responses, she will probably in some way get quieter after a while. If you leave a baby to cry for a very long time, eventually they give up and stop crying. Hence, as I said before, some babies won't show that they've got needs by crying. Um, or she may be soothed a bit, but her overall and underlying needs aren't soothed. But it will look as if she's a bit soothed. But because that first and, and sort of, as I said, the underlying need hasn't been resolved, it's more likely that she will um, become upset and show that she's got a need again. And so she will go around that cycle even more times than the baby we just talked about, who we described as having developed a secure attachment. Now, this little baby is also going to be learning things. Um, she's going to be learning about herself and about other people and about the world around her, just as our previous example. But she's probably going to be learning that um, people are not reliable, that they don't always come, that they aren't always kind. She might be learning that they're cruel, that they are not able to understand what she's telling them. She probably will start to believe that the world is a frightening place and a scary place and an unpredictable place. And she may well develop beliefs about herself like, I'm not lovable or I'm not wanted or I'm not important enough to have my own needs met. And this will also organize the way that she behaves and relates to people. And this, this is what we would describe as the internal working model of a child who's got an insecure attachment. Um, and it will be a blueprint for her going forward in her relationships with other people. So putting this into practice and thinking about what this looks like in a foster family, a very simple example is when, as a foster parent, um, over the lunch table, you say to this, your foster child, would you like some more roast potatoes? And what you mean by that is, would you like some more roast potatoes? But the child who's got an insecure attachment style will look back at that internal working model that I've described before and will look at what she's learned about other people and will go, oh yeah, other people are cruel, they're unkind, they're not responding to my needs. I know the world's a scary place. I know that I'm not worthwhile or important enough to get more roast potatoes. So go away, leave me alone. No, I don't want roast potatoes. And they get down from the table and they run off shouting about how much they hate you and how much they hate roast potatoes as well. And you're left standing there going, but what happened? What happened there? I just said, would you like some roast potatoes? And you can't see that all those things are going on inside the child's head that are based not on that moment that you're in with them, but on a lot of experiences that have gone before and have taught them about the world and about how other people are and about how they perceive themselves as well. So when you're Talking to children who've come from a different family and a different environment, it's important to, to remember that they bring all of those experiences to all of their interactions with you. And that's what will govern the way they behave. And it's not personal about your relationship with them often. It's about the other things that have happened in their life.